Hello, dear friends. Um, my name is uh, Alexandre Bichy. Um, welcome to the webinar of uh, the International uh, Society for Telemedicine and eHealth uh, for the month of April. Um, so this webinar is entitled um, Approaching COVID in the Digital Era, Management and Advice from China and Brazil. I have the most pleasure uh, to uh, have with me today um, a very important uh, uh, and very special invite. Um, Dr. Go Fu from China, which is the Director General for uh, Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And also Dr. Uh, Rodrigo uh, Santos, uh, which uh, is a um, um, medical doctor, internal medicine and infectious disease physician. He is the head of um, the infection control at Hospital de Clinicas de Porto Algere. So um, I am very pleased uh, to present them. I am very pleased also to present my co-host today, Dr. Adolfo Sparenberg, uh, which uh, is the co-chair uh, of the telecardiology working group. Uh, with that being said, I will uh, leave the word to my colleague, Dr. Adolfo Sparenberg, for a quick presentation of our international society. Adolfo, hello. Good morning, it's my great pleasure. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexandro. Thank you, Dr. Gao and Dr. Rodrigo for accepting to participate. Uh, I will just uh, would like to share uh, my screen. Uh, I kindly ask permission of uh, Dr. Alexandro. So uh, uh, would you allow me to share my screen, Dr. Alexandro? Please. All right. Now everything will be okay. All right. Um, is that okay for you? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So, uh, just a second because I need to, to define how to. Uh, okay. Here is the best. Okay. So. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, because we are located in different regions of the world. Uh, uh, on behalf of the International Society for Telemedicine and Health, I welcome all of you to this webinar organized by the ISFTH Telecardiology Working Group in conjunction with the ISFTH Executive Secretariat and the ISFTH Working Groups Committee. Today, as announced, this very special uh, webinar will, will be about the approaching COVID-19. You know? And we have two very, very special and distinguished guests, Dr. Gao and Dr. Rodrigo, to talk about this. Before going through the outstanding uh, presentations of today's session, it's my mission and honor to present some data through, through brief words about the International Society for Telemedicine and eHealth, as some of you are not yet familiar to our society. So this second slide uh, shows that our society is an NGO, a non-for-profit organization in official relations to the WHO and founded in 1997, exactly 22, 23 years ago in Kobe, Japan. The headquarters of the International Society for Telemedicine is located in Basel, Switzerland. And the mission of the ISFTH is mainly to facilitate the international dissemination of knowledge and experience in telemedicine and the health and to provide access to recognized experts in the field worldwide. Um, currently, the International Society for Telemedicine and Health has affiliated members from all over the world, in all continents. As you can see, we have currently 103 countries represented uh, as part of our society. Uh, Different membership categories are available, like national members, institutions, associations, individuals, nurses, and students. Um, 
The society counts on the support of several working groups, as you can see described here, uh, that in fact are a very important uh, segments of our society, composed by colleagues that are responsible for organizing practical activities throughout the year. And webinars nowadays represent an important segment of the initiatives of the ESMPH, mainly considering the current times when we are really restricted in terms of traveling abroad. Uh, the ISFTH organizes yearly a series of international conferences that usually rotate around the world. Unfortunately, in this year, due to the current pandemic, both the conference planned to take place in Lisbon in March, as well as the 2050 ISFTH International Conference, expected to be held in Takazaki, Japan, in early October, both were temporarily postponed or canceled. So we are waiting for new moments, for a new date. Um, at this point, okay, I, uh, I just would like to come back to highlight that this kind of international web conferences sessions that we like the one we are organizing today started several years ago, including the participation of nurses, students, and several working groups. There is something new at this point. Uh, on the main page of the ISCFTEH, we talk of a specific chapter that's dedicated to the theme of COVID-19, an important area through which ISFTH members, members and partners can share their information, experiences, and solutions concerning the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of information is now currently available on the website. Well, other important activities for the ISFTH members uh, include uh, the newsletter through its quarterly edition and the journal of the International Society for Telemedicine and the Health that the journal is coordinated by Professor Maurice Mars, Richard Scott, and Malina Jordanov. So affiliated members are really invited to participate through all initiatives. So those interested in joining the ISFTH can affiliate through different membership categories, as you can see here. You are all welcome to our society. And just to point out that students up to master's degree and nurses are free of charge membership categories. Requesting affiliation is really a quite easy and simple process. Just visit the ISFTH website and go directly to the how to join area. Okay. Uh, here asking me to start my video. Is that okay for you? Yes. So, uh, and finally, the last but not the least, this is the address of the ISFTH website. The ISFTH looks forward to welcoming all of you as new affiliated members. So thank you very much for this introduction, for your attention, and now, I'm very pleased to once again transfer the microphone to, to the coordinator of the session, Dr. Alexandru Mishu. Please, thank you. Thank you very much, Adolfo. It was uh, pretty clear. We have a very strong society. So it's my pleasure to, to give the word to our first invite, uh, Dr. Gao Fu from China. Thank you very much, Dr. Gao, for accepting uh, to uh, take part into this webinar. Um, we are uh, very eager to find out what is the status um, of the post of the first COVID wave uh, in China. And uh, thank you for sharing your presentation with us. Good evening, good anytime. I don't know where you are, but you're good. 
So it's a great pleasure for me to be here to share with you, you know, what we have done, what we experienced in China. But here I want to, to make sure, um, because as everybody knows, maybe you know, I'm a biologist. To make sure I have a bio, biologist sitting here and also some academic, academicologists here. I invite my two prominent colleagues with me here. One is our chief epidemiologist at China CDC, Dr. Wu Zuyu, sitting in my right hand, and uh, another epidemiologist, Dr. Zuli, uh, sitting on my left, left side. So if, after my presentation, if you have any questions, of course, as Director General, I suppose to know everything, because I'm a DG, but in case, I don't know. So I have epidemiologists with me, but of course, any biological questions come to me. You know, fire anything for my work, but anything for epidemiology, those two uh, colleagues will give you a clear um, answer. So here it goes. This is the virus. This is the slide I want to show you. So once we know it's a um, uh, pneumonia with unknown etiology, and we be a week, with a certain few days, we already know isolate the virus, we need a sequencing because the second generation, you know, uh, next generation sequencing. So we know the sequencing, so this is clearly, it's a crown. This is a virus, it's an old rabbit virus with a crown on the surface. This is why it's called coronavirus. So this is exactly what we got from the very beginning. We went, we isolated the virus with a week. So we saw the virus looks like that. It's a typical coronavirus. Of course, from the very beginning, we thought it might be a SARS. Maybe it might be less virus than SARS because we only have less than 20 patients. Of course, by now, we already know, you know, retrospectively, we might already have some patients in late December, even in the mid December. Because you know, December, the winter time, is exactly the time when all this flu or common cold. So you know, they mix with those diseases together. Of course, you know, and that finally we find this a new, um, new disease. It's not explained COVID 19. It's a new virus. Of course, I don't like the word uh, uh, SARS CoV 2 because it's not SARS. And uh, it's much severe than SARS. Whenever you write SARS and SARS 2, you know, it's very difficult to read the literature SARS and SARS 2. It's very hard to read. I still like to call it COVID 19 virus. This is my first one. Here you go. Uh, my second. Where? Okay. Oh. No, it's stuck. Sorry. No problem. That's a problem with my. It doesn't work. It doesn't move. Oh, here you go. So, this is back to give you what we got in China. You know, from early January, we thought we, you know, not, not many uh, cases there. So, this is why, you know, from the very beginning, we thought it might be a you know, very not that serious uh, virus, we even think it's not a SARS virus. So you, you see the early January, not many uh, uh, cases there. But suddenly we realize, you know, we have serious human to human virus transmission, human to human transmission. And then we realize, okay, this is a really new virus. You can see that you're on the 23rd January in China. We locked down Wuhan, the epicenter of this epidemic. You know, Wuhan is in central China. When you look at the Chinese map, it's in the central China. So we locked up, you know, on the 23rd and the, uh, uh, it's last about five or six days when it's got into, you know, climb to uh, in uh, early uh, February, climb to the plateau. And it has So the sound is not uh, so good uh, from China. We are hoping uh, Dr. Gao can come back uh, right away. Um, oh. We will be waiting uh, maybe two more minutes, uh, hoping he will be able to reconnect. Um, in the meantime, um, maybe um, if he will not be able to, to reconnect, 
maybe we will give uh, the word to Dr. Uh, Santos from Brazil um, and uh, maybe eventually Dr. Santos, we're waiting still for Dr. Gao to connect. <laughs> Well, internet, everybody uses internet Internet now, so um, it might be very difficult uh, sometimes to, to have a, an uh, over-the-ocean connection. Um, mm -hmm. Hello, Dr. Gao, can you hear us? That's okay, no. Great. So maybe, maybe Dr. Santos can, uh, can um, uh, proceed with his uh, presentation. Uh, Adolfo, can you please present Dr. Santos and uh, we will reconnect with Dr. Gao from China very soon. All right, okay. Uh, I don't know if the Dr. Gao, it seems to return now. Okay, yeah, he's, uh, he's online. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Gao. So the internet is, uh, we are having trouble with the internet. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you now. I will switch off your video and maybe we can hear you better and also uh, if you can share uh, the slides once again. No. Okay, uh, so maybe uh, Adolfo, can you please introduce Dr. Uh, Santos uh, with uh, maybe his presentation and we will continue afterwards with Dr. Gao. Okay, so are you sending a message to Dr. Gao so of she can, he, he can wait some minutes, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it's once again uh, my privilege to invite the next speaker, Dr. Rodrigo Pires dos Santos, to start his presentation. Dr. Rodrigo, as you said, is an internal medicine and infectious disease physician and, uh, and he's head of infection control unit at the Hospital de Clinicas de Porto Alegre in, this, in southern Brazil, uh, in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. He is also the founder of an e-health company called Qualis Solutions in Infectology. Solutions in Infectology. So, Dr. Rodrigo. You are quite welcome to this important session in a very particular moment. Would you please start your presentation? Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Adolfo. Good morning. I'd like to thank Dr. Adolfo Sparenberg and Dr. Alexandro Michi for the invitation. I worked at the Hospital de Clinicas, Clinicas in Infection Control and Prevention for 20 years. So most of my presentation are viewed by this perspective. Uh, for the last 10 years, I'm in the field of telemedicine. So my final slides will discuss our experience, our experience in teleinfectology. Brazil is the largest country in South America and Latin America, with 8.5 million square kilometers and with over 20, 211 million people. Brazil is the world's sixth most populous. The federation is composed of the union of the 26 states and the federal district. As you can see in this graph, Brazil is behind US, Italy, Spain, France, Germany, and China in number of cases by April 20th, and stays far above Japan, Singapore, and South Korea. In this Continental country, there are diverse rates of transmission among states, with states in the north and the northeast region of the country with higher numbers of infections and death rates as compared to the southern states. Sao Paulo state has the higher rates of infections and transmission and the highest number of cases in Brazil. As you can see here, 
the number of cases in the southern states are similar to countries like Japan, Singapore, and South Korea. Rio Grande do Sul is the southernmost state of the country, it has now over 1,000 confirmed cases, and considering estimates of mobility reports, the decrease in mobility of more or less 45-55% might have resulted in a reduction in 40% of transmission and has flattened the curve of case so far. Porto Alegre is located in the, sub, in the subtropical zone and thus features a humid subtropical climate. The city lies on the eastern bank of the Guaíba Lake is the capital and the largest city of the Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Sul. It is the 10th most populous city in the country with over 1.4 million inhabitants. On April 1st, the government closed stores, shopping malls, theaters, bars, movie theaters to reduce community mobility. Restaurants and public transportation could work with restrictions. The population has recommended, was recommended to stay at home, but was not prohibited to walk through the city. Hospital de Clínicas de Porto Alegre is, is an 842 bed tertiary care teaching hospital in the city of Porto Alegre. The hospital provides average and high complexity care through the uh, care uh, through the Brazilian Unified Health System, SUS. Hospital de Clínicas is a general hospital for clinical, surgical, adult, and pediatric patients. Uh, our hospital is referenced in our state for COVID-19 patients. The hospital has organized to care for COVID-19 patients, highlighting exclusive areas dedicated to care of these patients. Adult ICU area, pediatric ICU, neonatal ICU, obstetric inpatient unit, clinical and emergency inpatient units were assigned to care for these patients with an initial of approximately 100 beds, 50% uh, 50, 50 for adult and pediatric patients. Professionals in these areas were trained to care for these patients and also with regard to the use of protective personal equipment. The infectious disease, internal medicine, pulmonary specialists and ICU teams were responsible for patient care. Surgical procedures, consultations and elective procedures were canceled as the number of local cases, cases increased, guided by a contingency plan for patient care in our hospitals. Our strategy, for protection of healthcare workers is based in, on infection prevention recommendation. Hand hygiene reinforcement, use of PPE, environment cleaning, social distance, cuff etiquette, and open access to COVID-19 virus testing. In comparison of the provision of PPE in February and March, we use 33,000 medical masks in February and 115 in March. And so other PPEs uh, raised in numbers of use in, during the pandemic, as you can see in this graph. Our strategy for uh, treatment. Uh, in this statement, the Brazilian of Ministry of Health has recommended therapy with hydroxychloroquine for patients with severe disease. We at Hospital de Clinicas have agreed to participate in the coalition study, which is a union of more than 90 centers in a randomized controlled trial for testing therapy strategies. The coalition one for non-critical patients with mild disease assigned to receive hydroxychloroquine or hydro hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin or the control group. Coalition two 
for patients with moderate disease assigned to receive hydroxychloroquine or hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. And the coalition three for patients with severe disease were randomized, are randomizing to receive dexamethasone or the control group. We received our first patient on March 14th. Until April 22nd, it was 41 patients. Of these, 17%, 17 41% were admitted to the ICU. Most of them were male with mean age of 58 years. Almost 6% were on mechanical ventilation and for a mean of 30, 13 days of ventilation. Our hospital has a population of approximately 6,000 active workers. Much of this workforce was displaced for remote work, especially those at above 60 years of old. To date, uh, more than one month after the first COVID-19 patient in our institution, 840 visit visits of symptomatic healthcare workers were made at our clinic. Of these workers, 803 were tested for, uh, 840 were tested for the presence of the virus. They were tested by nasal swabs, by RT-PCR, and isolated until the, the test results. A total of 41 workers tested positive in this period. 23 were related to community or unknown source of transmission. 17 were associated with a cluster of transmission in a pediatric unit in our hospital. The number of workers tested positive represented less than 5% of the tested population. This, re this rate remained stable during the month of observation despite the increasing numbers in the community and the country. No healthcare worker that worked directly assisting patients with COVID-19 tested positive for the virus. From this review, the most common initial symptoms of these healthcare workers were sore throat, cough, headaches, muscle pain, and not fever. Most were tested on the first day of symptoms. As you can see, our healthcare workers had only mild symptoms of disease, and most of them did have not fever. This is strategy based on assumption that less symptomatic workers may transmit the virus to vulnerable patients or other healthcare professionals. And interventions to prevent transmission from healthcare workers include facilitating testing, expanding symptom-based screening criteria, for loving symptomatic and positive healthcare professionals, and creating a sick leave policy that are non-punitive Offer healthcare medical and uh, offer healthcare medical assistance and psychological assistance and testing for readmission at work. This strategy was also published in the article by the CDC at JAMA on April 17. In March 16, 16th, in a pediatric non dedicated COVID area, one healthcare worker member of the unit nurse team tested positive for COVID-19. This healthcare worker had traveled to an area of community transmission at that time and returned to the South and worked for two shifts with mild symptoms. This resulted in a cluster of infection in this unit and a prompt action was planned and put in practice based on hand hygiene, social distance, environment cleaning, and mild symptoms, symptoms alert for testing. After a week of investigation, all healthcare workers of the unit were, were tested. A total of 67 tests were, were performed and identified 17, 37% positive professionals. No asymptomatic healthcare worker tested positive, and most of healthcare workers had mild symptoms. 
During this investigation, we realized that another positive healthcare worker was working with mild symptoms before the case index. As you can see in this figure, the black line shows the symptomatic period while the professionals were working in the unit. There were a few other workers, there, there were a few other professionals working at the same time with symptoms uh, in this unit. Each line represents a healthcare worker. After this strategy of testing all healthcare workers, only two other infections were documented in the unit, and we are now with more than 22 days with no other infection in this unit. Dr. Fabio Dantas, head of occupational medicine, and, Dr. and Professor Ricardo Kuchenbecker, clinical risk manager, and myself and other colleagues are working in this project to diagnose healthcare workers' infections. This project is based on a combination of RT-PCR and serologic tests in different times of disease evolution to increase accuracy of this diagnosis. In the beginning of symptoms, RT-PCR and serologic, serologic tests are made. After five to seven days, After five to seven days, uh, another RT-PCR and serologic tests are made. After 14 days of disease, uh, the, another PCR. The dynamics of symptoms, presentations, and recovery are also recorded. And a series of RT-PCR are also applied after recovered. And if the RT-PCR stays positive, we test it every seven days. These strategies were designed to protect healthcare workers and only uh, return those which are free of disease and free of transmission. Telemed telemedicine tools were used during hospital stays of COVID-19 patients in our hospital. The patient visits, visits were restricted or not allowed in our institution. Video calling from tablets or cell phones were made every day to family members of an inpatient in order to talk about and pass information about the patient's state of health. This was made by the ICU team and psychology service, service in the, of the institution. As you can see here, the team in a video calling. Healthcare worker and patients who tested positive and were clinical stable were also followed every seven days by telemonitoring while in home quarantine or after hospital discharge. These contacts were made by doctor and psychologists and patients and staff were asked about worsening of symptoms and general well-being. Recommendations concerning home isolation were also made during the phone contact. The group of telemedicine also oriented patients who seek for medical assistance and our guidance, guidance related to upper respiratory symptoms. Other tools like coronavirus SUS was available for population information about the virus, symptoms, transmissions, prevention, PPE, diagnosis, epidemiology data, and news. We at Hospital de Clinicas have developed a risk assessment calculator to classify patients according to signs and symptoms of disease, patient management and prevention of dissemination of infection in the hospital setting. We at Qualis, with the use of our private web portal, are disseminating information about COVID-19 in hospital infection prevention, hospital organization, and management of COVID-19 patients onto my onto my crowded stewardship for 24 hospitals around the country. These remote hospitals from 50 beds to 400 beds are located in five states of the country, distant from capital cities. Our professional contact each hospital infection control team every, every week in order to revise hospital organizations and indicators. Real-time consultation related to infection prevention and patient management 
are available 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Since two, 2011, we have made more than 300,000 consultations. Finally, we are dealing with psychological crisis and any form of psychological counseling, counseling is very welcome. Because of psychologist shortage, telemedicine strategy to deliver this kind of care to families, colleagues, and friends is needed. Strategy, strategies related to rational use of PPE must be put in practice in the institutions to better protect our healthcare workers. And the indicators of use of this PPE must be monitored. Hand hygiene must be reinforced as one of the most efficient way for infection control. The rate of multi resistant bacteria in our, in our institution decreased by 25% during March as compared to the previous months. This is a preliminary, pre preliminary result that must be confirmed in the next months. Based on the current ICU capacity, it's important to emphasize and reinforce measures like social distance to mitigate hospital system overload and prevent deaths. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rodrigo, once again. Uh, it was a very, very interesting, I should say, an outstanding presentation about what you are, you and your team are organizing in South Brazil. And now uh, I think I should go directly to the next presentation, calling again Professor Gao Fu from China. So, Professor Gao, I hope you can exactly. hear us again. It's our privilege. Please, would you start and continue now your presentation? Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, hear yes, me? yes, oh, okay, we good. can hear you. That's okay, very good now. That's about, it'll be very quickly, very quickly. So, good, good anytime. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, anytime. So, this is a coronavirus. Clearly, you can see. We are weak in China, and uh, my scientists working very hard with four different uh, institutions, including China CDC. We, are, we have been working so hard together, so we define this is a new coronavirus with sequencing, whole genome sequencing known with the virus isolated. And this is a virus under the, under the electron microscopy. So next slide, please. So as I, uh, in China, you know, from the very beginning, you see that by the, uh, I think this slide tells you from December, uh, early December, you see, uh, until early January, you see the, the cases climb up starting from the 15th and 17th January. So you, you see this, uh, this figure tells you, um, you know, because retrospectively, when we define what kind of virus it is, we went back. Retrospectively, we found there might be already some um, uh, cases uh, in the mid-December because it's this the season for flu, for the cold, you know, everything is mixed there. So it's very hard for you to identify what it is. But by January 17th, 7th, we already isolated the virus. We know this new virus, this is a virus, this is a disease. By 15th, 17th, and 19th, it's climbed, starting to climb. So by, uh, I think, January 23rd, we introduced the method for lockdown. So this is the lockdown time on the 23rd, January. So um, in the plateau, continued for about last for about two or three or five, five days, then started to decline. Um, so this is a, uh, by the end of just January, it declined. So this is, you can see, this is a clearly looks like a ghost distribution. Because of this um, lockdown, someone predicted uh, about 700 million cases was cut. So otherwise, we would have you know, 70 million plus 80 million. You are talking about 80 to 100 million cases in China. Because the lockdown, it works. This is the uh, mainly see the epicenter in um, Wuhan. Look at on the right, right side, uh, right hand side, is the red column this is the now we we are, we are facing a new problem with the imported cases of course you know only two digital number but we are really in, 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 the, in the war 
again, the imported cases. But generally speaking, it's still under control. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here we go, lessons learned and sharing. Of course, you know, science-driven or science-based response is very important. First, you, you have to define what it is. We you know, eventually, we define this is the virus, it's a coronavirus. This is the seventh human infecting coronavirus. Before that, we have four um, cold-like uh, um, coronavirus and you know, very mild um, symptoms for the human infection. And then we have two severe ones, one is MERS, one is SARS. This is the seventh one. So what you know is a coronavirus because you know, you know what we should do. First, we don't have any uh, specific drug. We don't have the vaccine. Of course, you know, the ordinary people, the population have, have no herd immunity. So this is why everybody's talking about herd immunity. So this is why, you know, the core traditional public health measures, very, very important. You know, non-pharmaceutical um, intervention, NPI, is the major, you know, based on the science, based on, on what we know. So this is the major one, uh, um, uh, strategy. And also the critical bottleneck positioning and the settlement, community mobilization and response, uh, transparent public communication. Here I want to mention, you know, you want to make sure all the public, um, the people, they understand what you are doing. In my opinion, for any public health emergency, and three parts. The first part is science-based. You need to know what it is. And the second part is public involvement, public understanding. So here, Whatever measures, whatever strategies you implemented, if the public don't, don't understand, I think you are in trouble. So this is why the new world, everybody knows, infodemic. You are dealing with the epidemic. Meanwhile, you are dealing with the infodemic. If the, the public don't understand, then you will have a, you know, rumors and panic, all this, they, they work together, that will be a infodemic. Uh, this is what we say, transparent public communication. And that international cooperation, of course, you know, once we know what it is, we share the data with everybody, um, you know, virus has no border, they do need a visa, we know that, you know, this is why we, we have to work together. And the seventh, uh, we have to have a very strong leadership. And also, you know, everything must be coordinated and cooperated. So that's very important. Uh, of course, logistic support. And you know, in China, we know the epicenters in Wuhan. So, you know, the government organized so many um, doctors and the nurses, healthcare workers, plus a lot of, you know, equipment, all this, you know, rushed into Wuhan epicenter. So within two months, as you know, you know, the virus and the whole battle, we won the whole battle. Next slide, please. <clears throat> timely risk-based precise strategy. This is what we call the size-driven timely adjustment. It's very, very important because China is a such a big country. So, from the very beginning, you know the epicenters in Wuhan in um, uh, Hubei province. So what can you do with other areas? You know, inside Wuhan and inside the Hubei. You know, the different areas, they have a different uh, uh, population. And also, you know, as I said. So Dr. Gao, we can still uh, see the slides. Uh, the phone connection is not so good. Uh, we'll wait one minute and uh, eventually uh, I will try to call you by phone uh, for you to put the slides in. So we will wait uh, one more minute uh, mm -hmm. for maybe the internet connection to work better. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, um, so I, I would like to, to ask Dr. Dr. Santos, um, there are a lot of questions here uh, for the, both the doctors. 
So uh, for Dr. Santos, uh, there is especially a question regarding the treatment. What do you think, uh, what, what do you think for the moment that will be uh, the, the future treatment uh, in the absence of a vaccine? What is the better treatment for, uh, for, the, um, for this virus, Dr. Santos? And we will go, go, get back to Dr. Uh, Gao sooner. Okay. So you're talking, you're talking something about a treatment of vaccination, right? Uh, hello, Dr. Gao. Yes. Yeah. So uh, if you want, I can, um, can you share the slides or no? I'll try. Okay, great. So we will continue with your presentation. Yeah, it's no problem. These things uh, happen. The internet connection uh, 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 happens uh, frequently. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can see you also. Oh, okay, great. So finally, okay. You have to allow us to share the screen. Of course, I will do that right away. Sorry, I deactivated. Okay. 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 Can right. you see the um, screen? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. We can okay. hear you very good. So, so this slide I want to show you. You know, when we did we did all this work um, from a different stages, different time we have to readjust all our protocols. This is why we have a different kind of verses. Verse one, two, three, four, five, six, now it's verse eight. And it's for the treatment and also for the prevention and control. Here, what we have done for the containment, when we are talking about containment in China, in Wuhan, uh, you are talking about first, uh, personal protective measures, hand hygiene and mask wearing. I always think uh, mask wearing is very important because this, this is the virus, is transmitted by the droplets. The droplets, all, of course, now it's confirmed, not very high proportion, but some proportions of the aerosol. So in this case, it's a respiratory transmission. So it's very important to be protected for the healthy uh, population and also for, for, uh, from any you know, uh, patients. So hand hygiene and mask wearing. And then also you know, very important for the social distancing, everybody knows that, and detection, isolation, quality of any um, suspected cases, and also movement restriction in China. We suspended the public transportation, and uh, of course, you know we already know in Italy, in America, and in China from the very beginning. Not so common infection, hospital infection is a very important uh, factor here. Of course, environmental measures, disinfect disinfection measures, very important. And uh, I also mentioned earlier social mobilization, you know, health, education, risk communication, make sure what you are doing, and the public understand what you are doing. If the public would not, didn't understand, I think you are in trouble and uh, any measure wouldn't work. And um, my next slide tells you early and active case detection is very important. As early as possible, try to get hold all those suspected cases. And uh, also for the case management, of course, you know, China, we have a different system. We have very good community-based supervision system. In China, my community-level supervision is very strong. So all those supervisors, they keep calling any suspects, any um, uh, quarantined people stay at home. They will report to the supervisor twice a day. The supervisor call the suspects, uh, suspected cases, and also call the, anyone who, who is uh, under quarantine at home. So this is very important. And uh, the, uh, of course, for the confirmed cases and asymptomatic uh, infections, we also you know, try to do the isolation. More importantly, 14 days is the period for all this isolation and uh, health monitoring. So again, I'm calling for anyone, anywhere, try to activate your community level supervisory system. You know, we, we, we call it house-to-house, person-to-person, and the follow-up. 
So this is very, very important to get uh, the, to identify the source of infection. And of course, contact tracing. Uh, the good example recently we have, you know, that it's uh, because of a lockdown, uh, epicenter of Wuhan, now it's better, it's recovered totally. But now we have probably in northeastern China, all these cases, they are from coming back from Russia. You know, we have, we have a very broad border with Russia. We have a difficult, difficult problem there. So now there, we have also activated our local community level supervision system. So we traced back every single, you know, suspected cases. So, so far, so good. I hope the whole method still, will still work. I mentioned about, you know, uh, 40 days, twi twice a day, your supervisor try to contact any uh, quarantine people. Again, I mentioned already, mask wearing, I don't want to repeat this again. Health promotion, uh, we did all these, you know, posters, and uh, you put all these posters in the elevator everywhere to remind people. So this is the virus, this is the epidemic, and how it's transmitted, you should understand, you know, why you need to wash your hands, and why you need to wear the mask, the why, the how that you you can be protect you can be protected, and also this is the uh, we we publish so many booklets, uh, and also you know the multimedia uh, for uh, the propaganda. You know this give uh, some examples. Now the key experience uh, for whole China for the first wave, first four def defense lines. I call it defense line. The first line is in. Wuhan, Hubei, that's the epicenter. You know, it's a totally locked down, containment. And the second line is our capital. We have to protect our capital. Make sure, you know, this is the center for politics, this is the center for diplomatics, for everything. So, and the third line is uh, the area surrounding that Hubei province. And of course, the fourth line is the national line. We also think, so one, while we have the lockdown for Wuhan, Hubei, so what kind of strategy we are using? I have discussed with my colleague, Dr. Wu Zhou the chief epi epidemiologist here. We think it's a mitigation like. It's not really mitigation. Mitigation like and suppressing like. It's between mitigation and suppression. So this is what is the whole uh, country. Of course, for early, early detection, early reporting, early isolation, early treatment. This is very important. And uh, I also mentioned, we put this one, I used to get this, you know, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to say what we have done. So this is the war, this is the battle, we are fighting against the virus. This is the war, this is the war over the people. So this is the war over the people. This is the war for the people. This is the war by the people. You have to make sure everybody is activated. So this is why I use Gettysburg's Address, <laughs> President Lincoln's, over the people, for the people, by the people. So make sure everybody is activated. And of course, and then we have all these, you know, resources allocation, logistics support, already mentioned about this. So basically, this is what we have done in Wuhan. And to be honest, we are, we were very, very successful in terms of the containment to get the disease down in Wuhan, uh, in the Hubei areas, also in whole China. Unfortunately, the virus spread outside of China. Now it's, you know, everywhere in the world. Of course, you know, because of a different country, it has a different settings, different system. It's very hard to copy the containment strategy. Now we have to face another uh, second phase. Um, and you know, for uh, China, now we also think we got to dance with the virus. I don't think we can really get the virus down. The virus cannot be eradicated immediately. We have to live together with the virus. We have to play the game like Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry's story, you know, you have to work. Tom and Jerry must live together. So this is now, we are also resume our business. We are talking about resuming our school. So we are everything, we, we have already, or some areas, some provinces where they have, you know, roughly about 90% of business restarted. Of course, some small business. It's not started yet. I don't think we can really last forever just you know, with this lockdown strategy. So we have to dance with the virus. Not the wolf, dance with the virus. So control strategies now for the imp imported cases at the moment in China is the same like what we did for the Wuhan. You know, you want to control, make sure anybody coming out, they will be quarantined. 
uh, will be tested and quarantined for 40 days isolation. Of course, you know, and uh, again, um, try to trace back every single cases. Uh, yeah, already mentioned resume measures, and uh, then you know some of some areas 80 percent, some areas nearly 90 percent. We are still trying to encourage the people. So 97 percent of the textile industry, of course, quite understandable because we need mask. So we need the textile industry there. So we need a lot of mask, not not just for China but for the whole world. So this is what we are learning from the transition state at the moment in China, from lockdown, totally lockdown, containment to dancing with the virus. That's basically where we are and what we have done. I think me and my colleagues, Chief Epidemiologist Dr. Wu Zhuyu and Dr. Zhu Lei, we are ready to take any questions if you have any. Thank you. I cannot hear you. Yes. Uh, now, for your outstanding presentation, quite clear, and all thanks, Dr. Rodrigo, for your uh, presentation about the Brazilian situation on COVID-19. So, I would like now to once again invite Dr. Alexandro to coordinate the discussion. Dr. Alexandro. Alexandro, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Adolfo. Thank you very much. So, uh, th thanks, Dr. Gao. Thank you, Dr. Santos. I will um, just, uh, I, I would have two questions for Dr. Gao, and then we will pass with questions to, for Dr. Santos. So, for Dr. Gao, so how, how, important is, how important is testing? This is the first question. And the second question I would have. What, uh, what is the implication of the hot weather on the virus? So uh, if I understand well, your first question is, is about the testing, right? Yes. Okay. Testing is the key, in my opinion. Like, you know, like you, you live in France, I lived in uh, America and in the UK for a while. So like people to say, you know, what kind of house would you buy? The people say, okay, choose your house, three major factors, location, location, and location. For, the, for controlling this virus, testing, testing, and testing. Once your testing is completely implemented, you are in the business because you will identify any suspected cases, suspected asymptomatic infections. So this is why I think it's very, very important. Testing is the key. So, okay. Thank you. And what about the hot weather implications for the virus? What do you think? Is there, is there, is there less virus in the hot areas? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Initially, you, you know, when we discussed the virologists and epidemic of the city together, we thought by, by um, once the temperature and the weather becoming warmer, we might get the virus down. Looks like this virus it's really unusual. This virus uh, can adapt to the cold weather and also hot weather. You know, as you know, it's increasing now in Africa. It's also increasing in Russia. At the same time, the cold is Russia and the warm is Africa. So there's no uh, any effect from the weather, from the temperature, looks like. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Adolfo, uh, you have the word, maybe uh, for yes. Dr. Santos. A few yes. Uh, well, uh, I have some questions. Of course, I, I, I see that a lot of people are also posting questions and comments. But uh, something that is shaking our minds at this moment, because the number of cases here in Brazil is increasing, mainly north and in central area, São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro. But uh, first, Dr. Rodrigo, please, I would like to know what are your expectations in terms of the evolution of the disease uh, for the next two or three months? We are starting winter in South America. And mainly, we, are, we, we heard a lot of things of, of uh, potential utilization of drugs that could somehow uh, prevent the evolution of the disease, uh, including 
traditional drugs, as you mentioned, that we use it to treat and malaria. And recently, another one that uh, comes from Australia uh, about the utilization of ivermectin. Uh, is there something positive? Is there, are there expectations on that? Hi. Uh, did Dr. Gao leave? Um, thank you, Dr. Adolfo. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, we think that in the next few weeks, we're going to uh, uh, have uh, an increase, increasing curve of cases, um, mostly in June and July, where the, the, season, the seasonal virus enters and maybe this type of virus will compete with our uh, ICU, for our ICU beds and things like that. So we are expecting uh, a storm or something like that in the near future. Um, this time, we are we're being able to prepare ourselves to increase our beds, our number of beds, and to train our healthcare workers to test uh, the logistics of uh, uh, patients and management of patients uh, uh, in, in our hospital. And this is being very helpful for us to implement strategies to deal with the patients directly and to prepare our, our healthcare workers and our system for uh, assisting the future cases that will for sure increase in our area and we will bring another uh, respiratory disease with the winter coming. So uh, uh, I think uh, uh, when we look to the North Hemisphere, we could uh, learn from them and apply all the recommendations like Dr. Gall said, and we could apply here and, and test and implement uh, uh, our own strategies. Uh, related to therapy, uh, I think uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, remdesivir, vermectin, uh, we need uh, well-designed randomized trials to respond to this question. Um, I don't think we have uh, this answer now, and uh, for sure, for some severe cases and some individual cases, uh, we must use some of these drugs, but unfortunately, we don't have well-designed randomized controlled trials to respond uh, strictly to which is safe or not safe, which works, which drug works or not. Mm -hmm. Well. May I just com complete and ask you something? Uh, the last slide of your presentation, you demonstrated the utilization of your platform, mobile platform, that can support remote hospitals. Are you, at this moment, using this platform to keep in contact with those hospitals in terms of teaching them about all those uh, strategic um, uh, uh, methods and uh, procedures in order to de better uh, train those uh, the remote staff so to detect and to treat patients with COVID-19. Are you now using this platform for that approach? Um, we feel that the 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 the, the hospitals in located in the capitals and the, the the big hospitals, the university hospitals are well prepared to, to cope with this epidemic or more or less well prepared, but the remote hospitals, the small hospitals from remote areas in the interior of the country needs help, needs organization, needs counseling. So that's what we are trying to do. Every day we are in contact with these 24 hospitals that are connected with us in our platform and uh, we review the organizations, the, the patients. We have real-time consultations with infect, infectious disease physicians, with pharmacies, with nurses that deal with, with the local infection control uh, professionals. So it's, it's been very, very, very important for us to learn about the epidemic in the, the country, in the, the, the interior of the country, 
not in, uh, in big cities, not in big hospitals. So uh, we are trying to help this huge amount of hospitals that need help. And we are using telemedicine for this. And as far as we can uh, understand and experience, it's, it's, it's been very successful for us to understand the setting with, low, uh, with the local setting with, lo uh, with uh, a few resources and things like that. And we can uh, uh, train and, and answer for the questions of the healthcare workers. Thank you. Dr. Alexandre? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Santos. So I will have uh, one or two more questions for Dr. Santos, and then we will pass to Dr. Uh, Gao's team in China. So Dr. Santos, uh, we had a lot of, um, of attendees, of participants today, uh, more than uh, 150. Uh, so people want to know um, what, what is the exact period of uh, infectability uh, of the virus on humans? So is it two weeks? Is it three weeks? How long is the virus present in the stool also? Well, this question, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, we believe that in the beginning of the infection until the first day uh, of symptoms to the five to seven days of symptoms, maybe is the time of uh, the infectivity that we have uh, uh, more chance of, of infection or transmitting infection uh, where uh, uh, the virus uh, located in the, in the uh, uh, nose and throat and with cough and sneeze, we can transmit this virus. After that, uh, there's a, a reduction of transmission and but some and a few patients can still transmit for longer longer period of times. Uh, the, the, the virus uh, is detected in stools, but uh, as far as I know, there's no documented transmission by the, the stools. So it, uh, although it's a way that can be transmitted, this virus, we don't have uh, uh, this transmission uh, uh, detected or reported. So uh, I think uh, the beginning of the infection, that's why we should test uh, patients with mild symptoms and uh, maybe if, if you cannot test uh, everyone maybe uh, sign an alert for mild symptom, symptoms and uh, as, as I said in my presentations uh, our, our healthcare workers had only sometimes had only headache uh, muscle pain and maybe symptoms not related to uh, a viral infection or a flu-like symptoms, and they were tested. Um, another thing is that uh, uh, in the beginning, when we start this strategy, the healthcare workers uh, uh, look for, uh, for care in our uh, clinic, in our uh, uh, occupational medicine clinic uh, with five days of symptoms. Now, nowadays, they are looking for, for care with just one day or less of symptoms. So we are taking them away from the hospital with, uh, with, with, because of this strategy. Thank you very much. So I will have uh, some questions for Dr. Gao's team. Uh, I will just activate, the, activate the, their microphone. Uh, so uh, the participants are asking, um, um, what is the estimation of the percentage of immunized people in China? How many people do you think are immune to the virus in China right now? Uh, actually, we do not know yet. Uh, based on the uh, available data, we uh, estimate uh, the overall uh, infection outside of Hubei is about uh, one per hundred thousand, even less than that, because outside of Hubei, we do not have community transmission. It's only at a cluster in the family. So uh, we are now doing serological study going on. So the 
the data available also conforms our uh, estimation. Even in the Hubei, uh, the prevalence of infection is not as high as people think about. So it's also uh, very low. So we will soon probably take uh, one week, maximum no more than two weeks. So we'll have the uh, serological result. Hopefully that will be uh, issued to share with the public. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question um, for, uh, for Dr. Uh, Gao's uh, team. Um, on an epidemiological uh, level, what do you think about restarting? What is the, what is the danger of uh, restarting plane travel? Is plane travel uh, one of the, the, the acute danger we, we could be facing in China and maybe in Europe all over the world? Uh, is the plane travel should be restarted the, the last, like in the, in the spectrum of the economy? Should the, the planes uh, and the air travels uh, be the last sector that should start in order to spread the virus? So that is a great concern that we have. So now we uh, want all the factories will open and the school open and everything try to go back to the uh, uh, before the epidemic. However, we are very concerned, very cautious about a possible a second wave of epidemic. So even like uh, just one case may uh, generate a cluster or even community transmission. So the early detection of cases is critically important, critically important. That's why we have the massive screening uh, for people uh, from high risk uh, area. For example, uh, we have people like uh, Wuhan, Hubei, they travel to uh, outside of Hubei and they may have the RT-PCR screening. So try to identify uh, people who carry the virus. So far, the, the proportion of positive among these screened also very, very low. It's uh, about uh, one per hundred thousand. So based on available data. So uh, like in the Hubei, Wuhan, each day, they will screen about over 50,000 people per day. So massive screening use RT-PCR, so it's trying to identify people in the early stage. So we uh, try to prevent the possible second wave. Over. Thank you. Yeah, it's really impressive. And uh, thank you for all the work you're doing over there. I will just pass the word uh, maybe to Dr. Adolfo Sparenberg. Um, if there are any more questions for Dr. Santos and maybe uh, we'll be back uh, for five more minutes to uh, to the Beijing team. Um, so, Adolfo. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, well, we heard from Dr. Gao that testing is the key. And then, Dr. Rodrigo, what is the capacity of testing in Brazil at this moment to diagnose, to select case, and then to isolate those that need to be isolated? I, I saw that you showed some data that 5% of the staff that was tested uh, at Hospital de Clinicas tested positive and were asymptomatic. Uh, what can we do in terms of the general population at this moment in Brazil, in the South region, in terms of testing? Uh, we are dealing with this problem now uh, and the, the government is trying to uh, set a strategy to test uh, the community and, and the healthcare workers, but it, uh, the, the, the availability of tests is very uh, diverse across the country. As I said, there are hospitals that are well, are well prepared and others that are not so prepared like uh, big hospitals. Uh, our University of Pelotas here at Rio Grande do Sul has uh, started a study, uh, a serologic, serologic study to assess the, the, the prevalence of infection in the, the, the population. 
and the, the study started here in Rio Grande do Sul and uh, our uh, state of infections in our populations are very, very low. Less than 1% of infection was detected in 4,000 uh, uh, 4, uh, persons that were tested for serological tests. This, this survey is, is being extended to all, all the country in the near, uh, in the future, in the next weeks. We're going to have more details about this, this, this study. It was uh, uh, the, the first set of results that were, uh, uh, were put on public. And so we have, at least here in the South, a very, very low level of, of infection in our general population. Okay. Thank you. I think that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexander, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Santos. So, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Gao's team uh, from uh, Beijing. Uh, do you think that uh, now the face masks are mandatory uh, while walking on the street? And especially, are they, are they mandatory in open air places? Because we could think that uh, okay, in in uh, in open spaces we do not be we do not need the max mask. So what do you think? What is your opinion? Should we should we wear it all the time? Uh, I think it depends on in the China right now. I think the virus uh, is rare in the community right now because uh, countrywide we have uh, at least uh, uh, about more than three weeks home isolation for about. 1.4 billion people. So it's uh, only in the imported uh, uh, cases and also in the uh, Hubei, Wuhan. So however, we, uh, in order to prevent a possible second wave, we still encourage people wear masks in the uh, public places, particularly in the gathering or in the uh, close settings that are like in the meeting room or in the uh, a train in the airplane in the subway so in the uh, gathered places so we still encourage however we do not encourage people to use the mask at home uh, or in the open area i understand I understand thank you very much um what do you think about uh, the rate uh, of the false positive testing results uh, and also, why do you think uh, that China was so good at uh, uh, handling this crisis, but some other countries uh, had more difficulties uh, into managing uh, this crisis? Is it the, the health system? Is it because people are used to be, uh, to be uh, um, uh, uh, very uh, strict in their health? Um, Okay, so first of all, uh, about uh, the false positive, it depends on what, uh, which test kit you're talking about. For uh, RT-PCR, so we do not worry about uh, uh, false positive. However, for uh, serological antibody, we do. Uh, even you have the uh, best uh, test kit. For example, you have sensitivity 99% or specificity 99%. However, when that test kit used in, the prevalence is very low. In the population with a low prevalence, you still get a very high false positive. So for example, you get like uh, about 1% of prevalence if you use the 90, 90, 90, 90 uh, sensitivity specificity test kit, you still get 50% false positive. So that we call a, a predictive uh, positive value. In terms, of, in terms of China control epidemic, I think the, uh, a, a few elements contribute mm -hmm. to uh, the strategy or effectiveness. The first, I think China had experienced a, a similar outbreak in the 2003 SARS outbreak. So people learned from that uh, outbreak. The second, uh, uh, I think, like the mask, it's very important, we think, uh, based on the, uh, our understanding of virus shedding. So the virus shed uh, two, one to two days before the onset of symptoms. That means people are already uh, infectious. 
So even they, they do not aware. In fact, people are not aware, healthy people are not aware. So wear masks is very important to uh, prevent the uh, uh, transmission before the onset of symptoms. Uh, the third, I think very important is, uh, as Dr. Gao emphasized, uh, of the people, for the people, by the people, it's everybody take action. So once the uh, government sends a positive message or uh, prevention uh, actions, so almost every family, everybody follows. They stay home and have home as, uh, isolation, not a gathering. So all of this, social distancing, all take action at one time. That's just one day, whole country shut down, whole country. So that means there's no contact between uh, suspected and people infected. So that do reduce or separate uh, the two groups, people with virus, people with, without virus. So it's a, a cut, cut that transmission mode. So that is critically important. So uh, other countries, when they have order, people may not follow or each states or countries, like uh, they have their own authority. They may not uh, like China, we have one order, everybody follows. Over. Yeah, it's very good. Um, maybe uh, or everybody should follow this. Uh, I would have a question for Dr. Santos. What do you think about the plasma antibody therapy, uh, Dr. Santos? And do you think that uh, BCG vaccine uh, helps um, in this disease? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, there are a few... Uh, reports and recommendations to, to use uh, the, the plasma for therapy. Uh, and, but uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America has said that all these therapies must be used or, or uh, put in place in a scenario of a trial. So I think we have promising, uh, promising therapies and like this, like plasma therapies, but uh, we must put this in a contest of a trial. And I don't know uh, anything about BCG uh, response uh, to this, this virus or vaccine. Yeah. yeah, that was a question that was included here from a colleague that is part of the audience about the utilization and the the value of BCG vaccine, but okay, we still don't have uh, a final word about that. Yeah, okay. I'd Thank like you. to ask um, Adolfo, Adolfo, what, what do you think that uh, telemedicine has to play in this pandemic situation? Do you think uh, people are shifting to telemedicine and this is also available for Dr. Santos and uh, for our uh, Chinese colleagues? Yes, uh, well, you know, I'm enthusiastic about telemedicine in general. And of course, in a situation like this, in countries with huge territorial area like Brazil, China, and so many others, of course, that people and medical staff living in remote, in the countryside, should be benefit from the contact and guidance coming from referral centers, like the one that Dr. Rodrigo coordinates. And that's why I asked him, and I think in China, probably they are using technology like this in order to integrate remote communities with referral centers. Uh, I think it's time to consider more and more telehealth, digital health, for not just for guiding the therapy, but for guiding the measures and the basic uh, orientation that uh, should be applied to the population in general because people in remote areas are not uh, aware, uh, fully aware of those recommendations about social distancing, uh, utilization of masks, etc. So I see that through this kind of technique, you can put through e-health, through mobile apps, you can contact uh, the medical staff and even the population and put them uh, informed about the most important 
uh, uh, attitudes concerning the prevention of this kind of disease. And for sure that from now on, uh, telemedicine that includes education, like this session, will be more and more utilized because we are limited in terms of traveling. I mentioned that as part of the introduction that in this year, two very important international conferences organized by the International Society for Telemedicine and Health were canceled. And for sure, we need to take advantage of uh, this kind of platform in order to keep us informed, trained, and to keep us in contact in general. So that's my opinion. Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, telemedicine uh, is, is vital in these times. Um, I would like to pass uh, conclusions to Dr. Santos and then to, the, to, to our Chinese colleagues. So, Dr. Santos, uh, what do you think about the second wave? Yes, I, I think we're, we're passing and we're in the beginning of the epidemic in our country. We are dealing with the, the the first case here in our institutions in our state, uh, and we are, are we with the uh, isolation and the, the change in behavior of the community. We expect to at least uh, control the exponential exponential raise of cases in our country or our local state, uh, but. Uh, we we can uh, see in the near future that maybe uh, we have a, a huge number of cases that can uh, uh, exceed our capacity of uh, beds and ICU uh, apparel and things like that. Uh, so uh, we are now worried about the first wave <laughs> and trying okay. to control this first wave. And okay. uh, I think we've been successful so far, but our government is, uh, we are right now with some uh, recommendations of openings and some store openings and things like that. We are preparing for this first wave. I see. Uh, maybe our, our uh, Chinese colleague can answer. Uh, what do you think about the second wave? Uh, because uh, did it already start in China? or it will, you are waiting for it. Okay, so thank you, Chair. So regarding this uh, very important question, we think, yes, of course, we are already uh, in the uh, transition stage and uh, we want to find the balance between the disease control and the uh, economic uh, resuming. Um, it's difficult for us, to be honest, but uh, we are trying our best. So we've still focused on the uh, strict uh, for early measures and uh, the personal hygiene, hand washing, mask wearing, etc. And uh, uh, at the same time, we think we need to be prepared for the uh, potential uh, small clustering cases or uh, small outbreaks. It will not be uh, surprised if we can detect we can detect some uh, small clustering cases in the future. So uh, still we need to pay more attention to the uh, uh, potential second wave, in especially in the transition stage, especially after the resuming uh, back into the normal life, or we should use the new normal in the future. And uh, uh, we think this conference is very important, not only for sharing, but also for learning from all the international community and the professionals for China. So um, solidate so and uh, work together, fighting against COVID-19 in the future, uh, no matter where stage you are. Just like uh, uh, our Brazil colleagues mentioned, although you are in the uh, first wave, however, we are in the transition stage. But no matter which stage you are in, be prepared and um, take action as early as we can. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. So um, just to conclude, I'll, and afterwards I will leave the word to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sparenberg. Uh, so uh, I, th I fully agree what um, Dr. Gao and colleagues said. So we are in a war and we have to be uh, careful all the time, all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, even though uh, we won uh, a fight, the battle is not uh, over. Uh, also, I would like to, uh, to highlight the fact that, uh, as Dr. Santos presented, telemedicine should play a very important role uh, in what we do uh, from now on. Um, so, from my part, thank you very, very much for participating. Thank you once again to Dr. Santos, Dr. Gao and his team. Thank you very, very much. And I will leave the word to Dr. Sparenberg for final conclusions and goodbyes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you both speakers for the really the outstanding presentations and discussion that followed. That's really very important. That's the mission of the International Society for Telemedicine, to bring the information to everyone around the world. Unfortunately, we cannot do that via presence mode at this moment, but we can use this kind of platform. So that was a fantastic experience. I would like to thank the audience because we have more than 150, 130 people at a given moment attending uh, online this session. And the session of, of course was recorded. So everyone will be able to, to check again, those that were working at this moment, will be able to come home by evening hours and to attend the recorded session. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alexander, for organizing everything. And I hope we have a chance of staying in contact and having another session in the near future. So thank you very much on behalf of the International Society for Telemedicine and the Health. Goodbye. Thank you very much to everybody. And uh, okay, thank, you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.